also want to thank Professor Miller. He actually can't be here today, but he's been a lot of help in helping me prepare for my colloquium and over the years. Uh, I want to thank all my friends for coming today and supporting me, and I hope everyone enjoys the talk. So, I'm going to talk about game theory, specifically mixed strategy and Nash equilibrium. And I'm going to talk about how we can strategically help, or strategically use game theory to help Federer beat Nadal. Federer is arguably one of the best tennis players of all time, yet his record against Nadal is 10-23. I want to figure out how we can help give them an advantage next time they meet. Okay. So today I want to first talk about Brouwer's fixed point theorem in 2D. I'm not going to go through the entire proof because I don't have time and it's been proved recently in a couple colloquiums. For those who have not seen the proof, I'm going to go through a summary of how you would prove it in 2D. I'm going to prove the existence of mixed strategy and Nash equilibrium, talk about an application to tennis, and then eventually how we can use this to help better. <coughs> Right. Before I actually get into Broward, let's talk about what a Nash equilibrium is, a pure strategy and mixed strategy. So we have that a Nash equilibrium is when a set of strategies in a Nash equilibrium, if no player can do better by unilaterally changing his or her strategy. So what this means, in a game with a set of playouts, payouts for each player, each player plays their best response to each other's player's action. So each player is maximizing their payout in response to the other player's action. So here we have a game. We have two players, but myself and I can either do a good job of my colloquium or I can mess my colloquium up. And the other player is everyone else on campus, including everyone in this room, except myself. And you either cannot come to my colloquium or come to my colloquium. And I argue that we have a pure strategy Nash equilibrium when I always do a good job and everyone comes to my colloquium. So the way to solve for a game like this is we assume everyone else does not come to my colloquium and we look at my payout. If I do a good job, I'll be happy you didn't come, but at least I'll pass, which I argue is better than fail. And certainly, I also have a sense to do a good job if you come to my colloquium, because I'll be happy and pass, which is better than failing. And we can use the same logic for everyone else and show that coming to my colloquium is your dominant strategy. So thus, we have a pure Nash equilibrium when I do a good job and everyone comes to my colloquium. All right, now let's talk about a mixed strategy here. This is actually the game I'm going to talk about later in more depth, but let's start to introduce it. We have two players. The doll is the server, Federer is the returner, and each have two actions. The doll can either serve to Federer's forehand or backhand, and Federer can either lean to his forehand or backhand, or cheat or expect the forehand or backhand to give him a strategic advantage. So the payouts in this, in this case are per percentage of winning the point. So if the doll serves to Federer's forehand, and Federer leans to his forehand, the doll win the point 40% of the time, and Federer win the point 60% of the time. So let's go through how we solved the previous game and now in this game. We see that if the doll serves to Federer's forehand, Federer has a strategy to lean to his forehand because he guesses right. And if the doll serves to Federer's backhand, Federer has a strategy to lean to his backhand. So now we already see that Federer doesn't have one dominant strategy, so he's going to be mixing between both these best responses depending on the doll's tendencies of where he serves. And we can show the same for the doll. The doll is going to be mixing between where he serves depending on Federer's choice. Okay, now let's talk about Brower's fixed point theorem. We're going to define it as let S be the set in Rn be a non-empty, convex, and compact set. We're going to let the function f mapping S onto itself. Then there exists at least one fixed point where x star is an element of the set S such that f of x star equals x star. So to prove Brouwer's fixed point theorem in 2D, we're first going to have to talk about what a spur labeling is. So a spur labeling is the following. We're going to have some triangle. We're going to label the three main vertices 1, 2, and 3, as you can see on, on the triangle. Then we're going to label all the mini triangles whose vertices intersect a main line segment of the largest triangle, 1 or 2 along the 1, 2 line segment, 2 or 3 along the 2, 3 line segment, and 1 or 3 on the 1, 3 line segment and everything inside the triangle will be labeled however we want. And then Sperner's lemma says that every Sperner labeling contains at least one, one, two, three labeled baby triangle as you can see the three stars in our triangles. We're also going to define a triangulation of a triangle as a subdivision of the triangle into smaller triangles. <coughs> okay, so how is this going to help us? Let's let F be a continuous function mapping the form of triangle T onto itself. And we're going to say that T is compact, convex, and non-empty. And we're going to say that the point ABC, when we apply our function, 
is going to be mapped in some point A prime, B prime, C prime in very centric coordinates. And what this assumption is for is just keeps A prime, B prime, C prime non-negative and summing to 1. Same with A, B, and C. So now we're not going to go through all the details here, but now we want to start labeling this triangle in such a way that it's a spur label. So we're going to assume the three main vertices of our triangle are the points 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. And we apply our function. We're going to say that our function maps some point A, B, C, and this gets labeled as a 1 when A is less than 1, and then F of 0, 1, 0 gets uh, mapped at some point A, B, C as well, and this is labeled as 2 when A is greater than or equal to 0, and B is less than 1, and lastly, F001 gets labeled as 3 when A and B are both greater than or equal to 0, and C is less than 1. So now we've labeled our triangle with three main vertices, 1, 2, and 3. Now we have to show that our smart, smaller triangles with vertices intersect with the main line segment is labeled 1 and 2 along the 1, 2 line segment, and for the other two line segments. So let's just consider the 1, 2 line segment. So we have some point along this line segment, the function of f of a, b, 0. And this can be mapped into some point d, e, f. And by the same logic we apply here, if d is uh, less than the point a, we label as a 1. If e is less than the point b, and uh, d is greater than or equal to a, we label as 2. And then since f can never be less than 0 because it's non-negative, we can never label this point as 3. So thus we show along the main line segment <coughs> 1 and 2, we can only label the smaller triangle's vertices intersecting with that line segment as 1 or 2. And we apply the same logic to the 2, 3 line segment and the 1, 3 <coughs> line segment. So thus we have a Sperner labeling. So now we can use Sperner's lemma and we assume that we have some... 1, 2, 3 baby triangle denoted as A1, B1, C1, where A1, B1, C1 are the three vertices of this baby triangle. Now we're going to consider a sequence of n triangulations uh, with diameter of adjacent triangle's vertices tending to zero. So as we chop our triangle T into smaller and smaller triangles, we're always creating a smaller 1, 2, 3 baby triangle. And we will denote this smaller baby triangle as AN, BN, CN. So now since T is compact, we can use Balzano and Biasros' theorem that every bounded sequence in our N has a convergent subsequence. So our ver vertex AN has a limit point P. And since after doing N triangulation, adjacent vertices are, we're assuming the diameter goes to zero, they will all have the same limit point P, which will be our fixed point. Okay. So now we will prove the existence of a mixed strategy natural equilibrium. So what will we actually prove? We're going to prove that every finite strategic foreign game G has a Nash equilibrium. So what does this mean? We have a definition. Given a finite strategic form game G of S of I, which is the set of some strategies, which I'll talk about in a second, and U of I, which is expected payoff of player I, for player I is going from 1 to N, we will have some joint strategy, M hat, element of the set M. This M hat is a Nash equilibrium if for each player I, the expected payoff for player I when all players play some mixed set of strategies M hat is greater than greater than or equal to the expected payoff of player I playing a strategy J when player I does not play a mixed strategy M hat for all J. So let's prove this. So we're going to let M I be the set of player I's mixed strategies. So then we're going to have that M is just the set of joint mixed strategies of all players' eyes. So then now let's let SI be the set of player eyes pure strategies denoted as J. Okay. Last definition, we're going to let Mij be the probability that player I plays pure strategy J. So we have the probability player I plays J. Okay. So now we want to construct so how are we going to prove it now? We want to construct a function. 
we want to show that this function has a fixed point, and then show that this fixed point is indeed a Nash equilibrium. So let's define our function as the following. We're going to define f, mapping the set m onto itself for each player i and strategy j. We're going to have the function f sub i j of some mixed strategy set m equaling the probability that player i plays pure strategy j plus the max of zero of zero or the expected payout for player i of playing pure strategy j when player i does not play a mixed strategy m minus the expected payout for player i playing mixed strategy m all over 1 plus the sum of j prime going from 1 to n J prime is just another way to denote our set of pure strategies. We just want a different J from the one in the numerator. And this is going to be the sum of our the same max function, just plugging in J prime. Okay. So now we want to show that this function satisfies Browder's condition. So first we can show that the set is compact because we have that mij, which is an element of m, this probability always has to be greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to 1, so we have that the set m is closed and bounded. We can show that m is convex, because we can just choose some set m, which equals m1 to mn, all element of 0, 1, and then another set m tilde, where m, which equals m tilde, which equals m1 tilde, all the way to m n tilde, which also element of 0, 1. Now we can easily create some convex combination. When we set t less than or equal to 1, greater than or equal to 0, we can have some set m naught, which equals t times m plus 1 minus t times m tilde. m and tilde and t are all elements of 0, 1, so we have there a set m naught is an element of 0, 1, so we have that it's convex. Lastly, to show that the function is continuous, this max function, just the max of zero and a linear uh, equation. So we just have the max of a linear equation. It just, uh, or, sorry, we just have this a linear equation, so that's continuous. So the max of continuous function is continuous. The denominator is strictly greater than or equal to one, so the function always exists. So we have that it's continuous. And the set M is obviously not empty because every player I has at least one strategy. Okay, so now we can apply Brouwer's fixed point theorem. So we're going to say that f of M hat equals M hat. And it follows that f of IJ of M hat equals MIJ hat. So now we're just going to skip an algebraic step by multiplying the denominator over to the left after we apply Brouwer. And mij hat times 1 will cancel with this mij hat. So then we have the following equation. The probability that player i plays pure strategy j times the sum of j prime going from 1 to n of the max of 0 or the expected payout that player i plays some pure strategy j prime when player i does not play m hat minus the expected payout of m hat equaling the same max function, but plugging in j instead of j prime. Okay, so let's remind ourselves what we're trying to do. We're trying to show that m hat is, in fact, a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, and we will do this by showing that the expected payout of player i playing m hat is greater than or equal to the expected payout of player i playing this pure strategy J when player I does not play M hat for all J. So it is enough to show that this max function goes to zero, which will show us that inequality and we'll have Nash equilibrium. So we want to show that the left side of this equation is equal to zero. So let's do that. We're going to multiply both sides by this part of the max function and sum over J. 
So we have that the sum of j going from 1 to n of the probability that player i plays j times this, the expected payout of player i playing j when player i does not play mixed strategy m hat minus the expected payout of playing m hat all times by j prime 1. We can separate the sums because this is summing over j, this is summing over j prime of our max function. Okay. And this is all going to equal the sum of j going from 1 to n of our max function of 0 or the expected payout of playing just pure strategy j when player i does not play m hat minus expected payout of playing m hat all times by this j. I know this equation is getting longer and longer, it seems like it's getting complicated, but once again, we're just trying to show that this max function equals zero. And we can still do that by showing the right side of the equation equals zero. So let's just show that the sum of j going from 1 to n equals zero. If this equals zero, zero times whatever this sum is, zero, and then we'll have our result. So we can rewrite this as the following. The sum of j going from 1 to n of the probability that mij cat times the expected payout of player i playing j when player i does not play m hat minus the expected payout of m hat. I didn't forget to distribute the mij hat to the u of i m hat, but since there's no j in this term, we can just pull it outside the sum, and the sum of the probability is just one. So we have u of i, I u of i of m hat times 1. So let's consider this expected payout that I keep saying over and over again. So this is the expected payout that some player I just plays strategy J. He's only playing J against other people's strategy all the time. He's not playing a mixed set of strategies. However though, we then multiply this expected payout times the probability player I plays J and summed over all J possibilities. So in fact, he is playing, when we multiply by the probability, he's playing a mixed set of strategy m hat. So this is just the expected payout of playing m hat minus the expected payout of m hat, which equals zero. Now since the right hand, the left hand side equals zero, we have our result that the expected payout that player i plays m hat is greater than or equal to the expected payout of player i just playing pure strategy J when player I does not play mixed strategy M hat, which implies that we have the existence of mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. Okay. So now we've shown that it existed. Now let's figure out how we can actually coach Fetter. So just to remind you of the game, we have Nadal and Fetter. Nadal is the server, Fetter is the returner. Each player is going to play their uh, uh, strategy with some probability because they're mixing between each response. So here's our game. So I argue that Federer is going to choose his probabilities in such a way that Nadal is indifferent between serving to his forehand and backhand. And what this means is Federer doesn't want to lean one way and then give Nadal an advantage. He may have Nadal have some dominant strategy. He wants the doll to have to mix. So to solve for Federer's Q and 1 minus Q, how often he'll lean to his forehand or backhand, it's going to be a function of the doll's payoff. So just to be clear, the doll's payoff, if he serves the Federer's forehand, will be 40% or 70%. And that and 40% happens with Q, and 70% happens with 1 minus Q. So now we can just set up an algebraic formula. Fed, or the doll's payoff for serving the Federer's forehand and his payoff for serving the backhand do some algebra, solve for Q, and we have that Federer leans to his forehand 20% of the time. And we can do the same <coughs> logic for Nadal's choice of P, how often he'll serve to Federer's forehand, by looking at Federer's payoff. Same thing, we set them equal each other to make Federer indifferent to how he leans, and we solve for P equals 0.4, so Federer will lean to his forehand 40% of the time. 
So, so what, how does this really help us? We've solved for a mixed strategy, Nash equilibrium. How are we actually going to help better? So I argue during a match, as Federer's coach, you could track how often Nadal is actually serving to Federer on any given day. And if this probability ever deviated from our solved mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, then Federer would no longer be indifferent between either strategies. He would have a dominant strategy. So let's, let's look at a graph. So here we have Federer's success rate from leaning to his forehand versus backhand, depending on Nadal's choice of P, meaning how often Nadal serves his forehand. It's not a surprise that these two lines intersect when the doll chooses P equals 0.4, because that's our Nash equilibrium. It shows that Federer's indifferent between both options. So now we can say that if P deviates from 0.4, say P, P equals 0.6, Federer will always have a strategy to lean to his forehand, because his expected payout is always higher. Now let's assume, however, that Nadal has a great coach. His coach knows game theory, and he's told Nadal exactly what probabilities to use to make Federer indifferent. How else can we help Federer? I argue that we should tell Federer to practice. Yeah, he's one of the best players in the world, but they still need to practice, and they can efficiently practice. Say Federer is going to practice or play Nadal in a day or two. He only has a finite amount of time, so he can only practice his forehand or backhand. What is the best way to practice? How is he going to maximize his total winning percentage? So for the analysis, we're going to assume if Federer leans to his forehand, he's going to, or sorry, if Federer practices his forehand, he's going to increase his winning percentage more when he guesses right than guesses wrong. Meaning if he practices forehand and he leans forehand and he serves the forehand, he's going to improve that stroke more than when he get, leans back in but still hits a forehand. He's still going to improve that percentage, but not as much. So for the rest of the analysis, I'm going to assume that do, for practice, for every percent he can increase when he guesses right, he'll increase half a percent when he guesses wrong due to practice. So just to pull a room, how many people think Federer should in practice his forehand? How many people think he's practice his backhand? Okay, let's find out. So here we have the total winning percentage from practicing the forehand return. When we practice it, when he doesn't practice, we see that his total winning percentage is 35%, which is just where our Nash equilibrium was, was his total winning percentage. Now we've assumed for every percentage point he can add due to practice to when he guesses right, we see a change in total winning percentage. Obviously he could never actually increase probably anything over 20% because it's unrealistic, so we should only look at the 5 to 15% range, and we see that if Fender could improve his forehand 15% due to practice, he can increase his total winning percentage from about 35, 36 to about 39, which is still significant. Now let's do the back end. We already see that the line is steeper and is increasing quicker, and we see that if Federer can improve his back end return 15% due to practice, same threshold, he can improve his total winning percentage to about 42, 43%. 43% versus 39, it is a huge difference. A couple points in a match, especially on return games, can turn a match around. Lastly, one last graph to get the point across, that improving your back end is always more optimal than improving your forehand. For Fed, of course. <laughs> and just a quick model of critique. Obviously, tennis is not a, just a certain return game. There's a lot of strokes that go into it. Fitness, the doll's a lefty, maybe better hits his forehand too much. However, though, men's tennis, the most important stroke is serve and return. So I think this analysis could be beneficial to Federer. Hope you guys enjoyed the talk. I'd be happy to answer any questions. So I made them up, but they were, um, I chose them in such a way so that the server's winning percentage would be around 80-85%, or like 70-85%, to 85%, which is typical for a professional. And a returner, they win the point around 30-40%. to 40%. So I chose them in such a way so the total winning percentage would be accurate. And you calculate the total winning percentage by just, the, the, uh, the doll is going to win this quadrant 40% of the time. 
times 0 0.2 plus 0 0.4, and then you do all four quadrants. So you're assuming that neither player can tell what the other person is going to do before it actually happens, right? There's no, no I see which way he's leaning, and so I'm going to serve a particular way. Right, so there's multiple ways you could lean on a tennis court. You could actually move to the left or hold your grip a certain way. So if you move, your opponent's obviously going to see that. But if you just switch your grip and kind of just mentally prepare for one stroke, that's more of the leaning I'm talking about. But you're right, though, if you physically move, then the server is going to have some indication of what you're trying to do. And would that change the analysis a lot? or? I think that it? would complicate things because, um, at least personally, you can move one way to make, to then, it's like a different type of game. Just try to get in his head, he should serve this way, and then right, so like if you move to your left, then as he's tossing, you can move back to where you should be to try to get in the guy's head, so there's a lot more combinations to it's put you It's still there. a finite strategy game though, right? It's just yeah. more complicated. Yeah, it's more complicated, but you could do it. Questions? No, no. Thanks to the speaker.